<laughs> so um, obviously the superhuman jumping, that's an elf thing. Gladriel can do that because she's an elf. Um, stepping on a sword, why? A lot of people don't necessarily know that sword blades, certainly European style sword blades, are springy. Hi, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria, and I'm a historical combat instructor and antique weapons dealer. And today I'm going to be looking at a couple of fight scenes from the Rings of Power. So first thing to mention is that I think they've done a really nice job with a lot of the armor. You can see that it's most of it appears to be decent metal armor, or at least even if it's made of some type of synthetic material, most of it looks like it's metallic. And equally the weapons, they've got a very distinctive design. And I also like the way that they didn't just copy Peter Jackson's aesthetic exactly, but it's very clearly linked into it. So you can watch the Rings of Power, you can watch the Peter Jackson movies, and there's a sort of harmony to the arms and armor that are shown. They, similar types of swords, similar types of armor. And this, of course, is contrary to actually what we see in Tolkien's books, where actually we're probably talking about an earlier period of technology. So probably mail, aka chain mail, rather than plate armor and things like this, and probably one-handed swords and shields rather than two-handed swords. However, due to the Peter Jackson movies version of Tolkien's world, it's very much a kind of inherited knowledge that uh, most heroes in the Lord of the Rings kind of world are supposed to be using two-handed swords or long swords and that's what we see being used in this scene by the elves predominantly. So that arrow coming into the uh, the orc's face mid-combat, you've got to kind of wonder where that arrow's coming from because usually in battle you would get you know archers shooting at the enemy and then you get a melee but you wouldn't normally therefore get your archers shooting into the melee in which you're now involved because there's a very high chance that they're going to hit you and it has to be pointed out that the hero here is helmetless however it's very much uh, it's a bit of a trope for lord of the rings um, on screen to have the heroes not wearing helmets now the common argument is that so we can tell who the heroes are i've always argued look you can just have a hero's helmet you can have it with a certain crest or a certain style of helmet or just an open-faced helmet you can still see who the hero is i think it's a bit annoying when you when you see someone wearing full plate armor they're very well protected against all sorts of weapons but they've got their helmet off but that is really accentuated in this scene because we've got this orc being shot in the face with an arrow. One little slip, one move in the wrong direction, that arrow could have hit, you know, the wrong people. Or is that already hitting? Is that an orc arrow? Are the orcs shooting? Who knows? But anyway, usually we don't see arrows flying into melees. <laughs> so just that final kind of scene where what are they doing where they're not really wrestling he's not trying to hurt the orc the orc doesn't seem to be trying to hurt him i'm not sure what's happening in this scene and the fact that he's helmetless means he's extremely vulnerable now just to be a little bit kind i would say that final scene looking at the big masked melee it does look really cool it's maybe a little bit too mixed up usually two armies want to know who's on whose side and they tend to bunch together and you tend to come into combat with lines nevertheless it, it does it does look cool and it looks bloody and violent and i've got to say the first time i saw this i was quite impressed and thought yeah i'm going to enjoy this Just a little detail there, arrows on the uh, back. This is much like swords on the back. Hollywood loves to put arrows on the back. Through most of history, through most cultures all over the world for thousands of years, arrows have predominantly been worn at the hip, <laughs> as have swords. There are some exceptions. There are some occasions in history when people put arrows in quivers on their back. So it's not totally incorrect, but it's massively overrepresented in fantasy. If we just look at history as the model, then in history, Predominantly arrows worn at the hip. Just a minor detail there, you can just see that he's got very fine mail, or AK chain mail, um, on his forehead. And this is another common movie and TV show thing that we often see mail or chain mail worn against the bare skin. Now, not to say this never happened, particularly it sometimes happens with collars, but generally speaking, having mail on your head will confer very, very little protection from any of the energy going straight into your head because mail might prevent a cut or in some cases a stab, but if it's just 
just sitting directly on your head, then if someone donks you on the head with just a stick, then it will make no difference at all to you the fact that you're being hit on the head with a stick. So really, mail needs some layer of fabric at least, and preferably a thin layer of padding, sometimes quite thick padding underneath it to really function optimally. Very strange pose there. When I first saw this um, scene, I remember thinking that was a person drawing a bow, but it's actually a person holding a torch in front of themselves. Almost definitely inspired by the modern use of a tactical flashlight with a pistol. It looks a bit weird with a sword, because why would you rest a sword on your <laughs> lead wrist like that? Because you're kind of blocking one of the lines of movement for the sword. You'd be better holding them separate, because you'd still get the light from the torch, and then you'd be able to move your sword in any direction instead of resting it on the arm. That being said, there is a sword buckler fencing position known in Italian as Guardia di Sopra Braccio, where you do put the sword arm across the um, buckler arm with the buckler held out in front of you. So yeah, maybe it's sort of plausible. Maybe it's a special elf thing, I don't know. But again, we see the male coif directly on the head without any padding or even a hat underneath it, which is just a very bad idea. Swords on backs were almost never a thing. There's some rare exceptions. They were occasionally carried on the back when they were particularly large swords in Japan, no dachi. Certain other places they were very occasionally put on the back. But generally speaking, in the Middle East, in Africa, and most of Asia, in, in Europe, throughout the many, many centuries, swords were not worn on backs. The main reason is it's really difficult uh, to get the sword out if it's on your back. And if the blade is over a certain length, you do not have the extension in your arm to get the sword out at all, unless you make a very invent some kind of weird and wacky scabbard that no one ever did in history. So swords usually worn at the hip or carried in the hand. Just carried, carrying them in the hand was not an unusual thing to do at all. <laughs> so um, obviously the superhuman jumping, that's an elf thing. Gladriel can do that because she's an elf. Um, stepping on a sword, why? A lot of people don't necessarily know that sword blades, certainly European style sword blades, are springy. This is not true of Japanese style sword blades, incidentally, because they're only edge hardened. European sword blades are spring tempered. So this sword here, you can see it bends like a leaf spring. It is a leaf spring. Theoretically, someone holding a good, strong, sturdy sword with the point on the ground, if you jumped on the blade, you could get some spring out of it, a bit like a springboard. And I, I've got to admit, I kind of love the idea of that, so I'm not going to criticise them for doing that here. Although, potentially it might damage the tip of the sword, because remember, all of that energy is going to be resting on the very tip of the sword here, which might which might potentially bend or even snap the very tip of the blade. But they're on ice, so I don't know whether that would happen or not. So using a blade as a springboard, why not? A fantastic idea. And if you're an elf, I'm sure it can work. So I really like the cut, the cut and the roll at the hamstring there. It looks cool. It's well executed, well choreographed. But I, most of all, I love it because it highlights the fact that you've got to go for weak points against a massive creature like this. Got to go for its hamstrings, its arteries, its you know breathing, its sight. You've got to think of the weak spots, and it's a bit like fighting an opponent in armor. What are the weak spots? How do I attack them? So I love that. So I actually love seeing the different uh, cultures kind of design their aesthetic. And I, I think that was something that was done really, really strongly in Peter Jackson's movies. And I think it looks like they've managed to continue that in Rings of Power. You know, dwarven armor and weapons look like dwarven armor and weapons. You can, you can kind of get a sense for whether a sword is elven or human or dwarven just by looking at it. And I like that. And that's realistic to the real world. So I'd like to see more fighting, a little bit more combat, and also combat in strange situations and strange environments. Because, you know, just seeing two people have a sword fight, we've seen a million times before. But seeing someone like there fight an ice troll is really something quite unusual and quite different. So I like seeing creative solutions for how would we fight this opponent, uh, whether it's prepared or unprepared, how do we deal with the environment? So I like seeing uh, creative storytelling solutions to how the arms and armor is actually used in these weird and wonderful fantasy uh, situations. For more expert react videos like this one, make sure to watch Matt Easton reacting to The Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, or Return of the King.